Let us talk about the hijab judgment. The Karnataka High Court will declare its verdict on... An Indian court has upheld a ban... ...on Muslim girls wearing hijab. Wearing of a hijab is not really a religious uh, practice. On 24th March, the Supreme Court decided not to grant an urgent hearing to the hijab-wearing students against the Karnataka High Court judgment that upheld a ban on hijab in classrooms. Previously on 15th March, the High Court had ruled that the notification by Karnataka government regarding the ban on hijab inside classrooms is valid and will continue to operate. It examined verses from the Quran and concluded that hijab is not essential to Islam. In effect, the court held that if a Muslim girl wants to enter a classroom, she must keep the hijab either at home or in her bag. So how did the court reach this conclusion and what reasoning did it use in justifying the ban? We will answer all these questions as we examine the verdict in detail. On the surface, the case appears to be pretty simple. A group of Muslim girls were stopped from entering classrooms because they wore a headscarf. Many were outraged. Prominent politicians, intellectuals and activists questioned the correctness of the policy. But how did all this come about? For this, we travel to Udupi, a coastal city in the Indian state of Karnataka. Udupi is known for its temples. And of late, an increasing bend towards Hindu nationalism. Muslim girls in Udupi alleged that they were not allowed to sit in class unless they removed their hijab. So what happened and how did we get here? To understand the issue, let's briefly look into the timeline of events. The hijab who came to the fore on January 1 at Government PU College in Udupi, where six female students claimed that they were not allowed to enter classrooms. Twelve girls submitted a written request to their principal to allow them to wear the hijab. The school flat out refused. Hindu students soon started protesting with saffron shawls, saying that if Muslim girls were allowed to wear hijab, they too should be allowed to wear saffron shawls. The girls did not relent either. They stood outside, pleading to be let in as school gates were shut on them. Left with no choice, the girls decided to take the case to the High Court. The court passed an interim order restricting students from wearing any religious clothing. School after school in Karnataka started refusing entry to Muslim girls. This was seen as a victory by those who prevented them from entering school premises. And as if on cue, deplorable videos showing Muslim women being made to take off the hijab went viral. Protests by saffronized students and counter-protests by Muslims started spreading across Karnataka. On 15th March, the Karnataka High Court finally delivered its judgment spanning 129 pages banning the hijab in classrooms. The court's judgment can be summarized in the following three points. It held that the hijab can be banned because it is not an essential practice in Islam. It also said that the government has the power to prescribe uniforms in school and that the hijab ban does not violate the fundamental rights such as the right to privacy, the right to equality, and the right against discrimination. We'll first take a look at perhaps the most controversial part of the judgment, which is the court's decision that hijab is not essential practice in Islam. The court said that hijab is not essential because the Quran does not punish people for wearing the hijab. It cannot be said to be compulsory. It also said that the purpose of the hijab was to protect women from molestation during the advent of Islam. And since those conditions do not exist today, hijab's purpose is not served. Finally, it noted that hijab is only a cultural practice as opposed to a religious one. But you might ask, why did the court have to do this exercise at all? This is where the court makes its first mistake. The court needlessly went where it did not need to go. The state has said to the court that we pre believe in freedom and dignity and we want to encourage practices that are not derogatory to women rights and we want to encourage individual choices. The presumption is that all of this, the wearing of the hijab breaches, but the court never examined any of it. The court just endorsed that point of view. It frames the issues in a manner that puts the burden of proof on the petitioners themselves. 
कोर्ट ने कई सवाल में ऐसे पूछे जिसने लड़कियों पर बहुत हैवी बर्डन डाला इतना सख्त बर्डन ऑफ प्रूफ मुनासिब नहीं है कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल मैटर्स could in the karnataka high court simply ask the government why should hijab wearing girls be stopped from going to school it chose not to do so so what is the essential practices test article 25 of the indian constitution gives the right to every person to practice and propagate their religion the question then becomes which practices are religious and are all practices protected under article 25 the essentiality test requires the court to see whether the community considers a practice to be integral to their faith and whether it is a genuinely held belief and not superstitious let's look at what supreme court has said about the essentiality test over the years the shirurmat case was the first time that the court dealt with the test it held that the term religion in article 25 covers all rituals and practices that are integral to the religion next in the devaru case the supreme court held that the court has the power to decide which practices are essential to religion this allowed the court to address questions integral or internal to religion and thereby define the very nature of the religion itself then in the hanif qureshi case the court held that cow slaughter was not an essential part in islam and then in the tandava case the court narrowed this test further it held that for a religious practice to be considered essential it must be as old as the religion itself in simple terms this means that any practice that came after the religion was formed would not be considered essential again in 1995 the court while discussing if the government has the power to acquire a mosque decided that a mosque as a place for worship is not essential in islam as should be clear from these cases the essential practices test is riddled with inconsistencies and ambiguity So why is this test a problem? It is because this test leaves a lot of power with the judges to impose their own perception of religion over the views of the believers themselves. Legal scholars have criticized this test. They point out that the judiciary has styled itself as the religious reformer to cleanse religions of superstitions and to reform them to suit its own idea of 21st century rationality, which they are not trained to do. The court also does not address the genuine belief standard laid down by the Supreme Court in the Biju Emanuel case where the court said that the question is not whether a particular religious belief or practice appeals to our reason or sentiment but whether the belief is genuinely and conscientiously held as a part of the profession or practice of religion our personal views and reactions are irrelevant now if we were to apply this to the hijab case the only thing that should matter is that the girls genuinely believe that wearing it is a part of their religion that is it we know for a fact that muslim women in karnataka continue to wear the hijab despite the many attacks on them i'm not going to give up or mai ladungi mere hijab ke liye ladungi kyunki hijab mera identity hai mera pride hai and mai hijab ke liye kitna ho sakta hai only shows the strength of the belief in the hijab which the court failed to consider Another aspect that the court did not consider was that the hijab issue was not a case of religious reform. Hijab wearing girls did not go to court saying that the head scarf oppresses them. In fact, the girls wanted to wear the hijab which they wanted the court to affirm. Yeah. It's more like telling us to choose between our education and religion. That's the wrong thing which people are doing. However, the court took it upon itself to become an emancipator for Muslim women, completely ignoring the individual choice of the Muslim students. It relied on a single commentator, Yusuf Ali, to decide on whether the hijab is essential. The court ignores the fact that in India, the overwhelming majority of the people belong to a certain school of thought, and they're guided in their views by the positions taken by the recognized expert of these schools. all these schools have unanimous views that hijab includes covering of head chest and other parts of the body though they may differ about covering the face the court should have given consideration to these views rather than that of a minuscule minority let's go back to why the court said hijab was not essential it gave three reasons for concluding that hijab was not essential we will show how all three of these approaches were flawed look at reason number 1 where the court says that hijab is not essential because there is no punishment for not wearing it 
but does this really make the hijab non obligatory for this we must understand the nature of obligations in islam when it comes to wearing the hijab islamic scholars agree that hijab has three parts what is prohibited haram or mamnu what is obligatory that is fard and what is desirable even if not obligatory which is called mustahab according to the quran not to show of their adornment mainly covers the prohibited part and to draw their veils all over their chest covers the obligatory part indulging in a prohibited act or not performing an obligatory act are both sins in islam but indulging in a prohibited act also invites worldly punishment for example one may not be punished in the world for not offering prayers or fasting but one will be punished for gambling or drinking alcohol but what happens if you do not practice an act considered obligatory will you not be questioned or judged belief in the afterlife is one of the central tenets of the islamic faith muslims believe that it is judgment day where the accounting of all sins and actions will take place so even though an obligatory act may not be prescribed a worldly punishment muslims are bound to follow that act because the quran commands it now come to reason number 2 where the court makes a somewhat strange argument it says that because the hijab was practiced before the advent of islam it is only a cultural practice in support of this the court cites a term paper a college assignment from a writer that she wrote as a student but how correct is this if a practice is religious but also has cultural origins does that mean it cannot be a part of islam no there are many cultural practices that are mandated by religion and many religious practices also become part of a culture there is no disagreement on this in islamic law islamic scholars agree that during its inception islam had three approaches to cultural practice it prohibited a practice that is considered abhorrent like female infanticide or it would identify the cultural practice and add restrictions such as imposing limits on polygamous marriages or it would recognize and affirm the cultural practice at hand such as the penalty of paying blood money in cases of murder the hijab is one such practice the quran recognized that women covered their heads adopted that custom as a part and parcel of the religion and then extended that practice to include covering everything but the hands and face in this way the practice of women covering their heads is no longer a customary consideration alone as the karnataka high court wrongly suggested rather it transforms into a divine commandment finally we come to reason number 3 the court further notes that the hijab was introduced for a specific purpose which was to protect women from molestation however the court rhetorically ask whether such conditions still exist but has the modern world really moved on let's look at some stats according to the who globally about 1 in 3 that is 30% of women worldwide have been subjected to physical or sexual violence in their lifetime thus the assumption underpinning the judgment that women live in a safer world is unfounded the court does not cite a study or evidence to back its claim so the court's understanding of what is essential to islam based on punishment alone is flawed after concluding that the hijab is not essential to islam the court turned to the question of uniforms the court effectively said that the muslim girls cannot wear the hijab because it goes against the very purpose of a uniform which is to introduce homogeneity for the court therefore the uniform was the most important thing and not the education of the students but that is not the only issue the judgment violates the right to education of muslim students itself who were barred from attending classes and giving exams unless they remove the hijab the court also said that the hijab cannot be accommodated because it could affect the uniformity of classrooms but as the constitutional scholar gautam bhatia points out this reasoning is wrong a reasonable accommodation is an adjustment made in a system to accommodate or make the system fairer for an individual based on that person's need this concept assumes that there is already an existing uniformity but this uniformity is insufficient in accommodating a diverse and plural society like the hijab wearing girls in this case the karnataka high court was only required to see if accommodating the hijab would undermine education are you not taking your exam are they not allowing you to take exam please ma'am 
Will girls who choose to wear their hijab forever now have to make a choice between their future and their faith as again today two girls were torn away? The court does not do this. Instead, the Honorable Karnataka High Court sanctifies the uniform in the place of education. The court then examined the important question of whether the hijab ban is discriminatory. The court simply said that the ban applies to everyone and is religion neutral. In other words, according to the court, there is no discrimination because the dress code is equally applicable to everyone regardless of their religion and gender. On a deeper look, we find that this is not true. While it might look on the surface that the ban affects everyone, it disproportionately affects hijab or turban-wearing students. The court also used secularism in a contradictory manner. While on the one hand, the court defines secularism in the Indian context as one of Sarv Dharam Sambhav, it actually applied the French version of secularism, which separates religion from the public domain. The bill doesn't actually single out any one religion. But some French Muslims say it's targeting them and that it's being used to score political points. A good Muslim is an invisible Muslim in this country. They brought in all kinds of measures to keep religion out of public life. To the point, though, that some people accuse the state of going after religion. Critiques of French secularism argue that it enables the exclusion, marginalization and othering of religious minorities by casting majority religious practices as national cultural practices. So from a tool, a legal tool that was aimed to protect religious freedom, it became a tool to target religious visibility. And then sanitizing the public sphere from minority religious influences. It goes back to a centuries old pattern of how the French government has tried to control religion. Indian constitutional secularism is different, which the court notes as well, but doesn't apply to the case at hand. It does not require the sanitizing of the public sphere from religious influence and rather is celebratory of religious diversity. The celebratory nature of Indian secularism can be seen by the specific protection offered to the carrying and wearing of the Sikh Kirpan under Section 25 of the Constitution. कोई भी employee दे उते जो domestic airport ते काम कर दाए उसनु किसे भी तरीके अपने ककार रखन उते मनाई नहीं होगी. The girls had argued that the hijab is also an act of expression that should be protected under Article 19 of the Constitution. The court, however, rejected this argument stating that once a student enters a school, her rights are diminished. I am sure everybody would agree with that. Individual choices uh, would uh, result in chaos. Then the insistence of a particular school dress by every educational institution should be considered reasonable restriction and thereby the principle of institutional discipline prevailing over individual choice has been upheld. Hmm. That is, she has lesser rights. The court cites no case no precedent nor any legal authority that would justify such a conclusion. Article 21 of the Indian Constitution guarantees individuals the right to privacy. The prohibition on hijab violates this right. The right to choose is a subset of the right to privacy. The court simply discards this argument by saying that privacy in this case is not the core issue. The petitioners had also argued that the ban on hijab violates the dignity of Muslim women and invades their sanctity of bodily privacy. Without hijab, I'm not at all comfortable. Like, uh, it makes me like feel like I am, I'm like, I'm sitting naked. Like, to Muslim women, wearing the hijab enhances their privacy by creating a sanctified public space. Hijab wearing women see the hijab as an extension of the fundamental practice of their faith. The ban, which the court upheld, requires Muslim women to partially disrobe before entering any space. This is humiliating and triggers indignity. The court simply does not consider this argument. So what effect will the hijab ban have on Muslim women in general and the Muslim students in Karnataka in particular? Scholars on France's headscarf ban found that such bans primarily hinder the ability of Muslim girls to access education. Interestingly, they also found that these bans strengthened religious identities for young Muslim women who were most affected by them. The Karnataka High Court judgment will now be appealed before the Supreme Court, which has already declined to hear the matter urgently.
And the Supreme Court today refused an early hearing on police challenging the Karnataka High Court verdict on the Karnataka government's ban on hijabs inside classrooms. The petitioners had sought an early listing of the issue, citing upcoming school examinations. Even as the matter limbers on, it is the Muslim girl students in Karnataka whose future in education remains uncertain.